Hey guys, such a great episode here with Clark and his work regarding the sun. Really a lot of information and by the end of the episode it did seem like we merely scratched the surface. So definitely going to be having Clark on for a round two. We are up on YouTube. Subscribe to us there. There's a new tab on the main page of the website that will let you submit a guest request. So if you have any show ideas or people that you find interesting and you'd like for us to talk to, fill out the form and we'll do our best to get a hold of them. But yeah, guys, really interesting episode. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you for listening. It's the human experience coming at you. We've got Clark Stewart in our presence this evening. Clark, I've been secretly obsessed with what the sun is doing for the last decade. So welcome to Human XP, man. It's glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here. It's so, uh, excellent to have other people interested in an area that is otherwise sometimes fairly nerdy and uh, quite wide in its scope. So there's actually quite a bit of material I've been pouring over for the last 10 years. Yeah, there's some there's definitely some high level physics math behind this. So I just yep. I want to lay kind of a foundation <laughs> for how you got into this work and and what your what your education is, what your background is. Could you go into that for us? Sure, sure, sure. Well, definitely I've always been fascinated by science since I was a kid, so it was something that I pursued wholeheartedly from a very young age. I s- stopped reading fiction in grade four. So since grade five onward, I've been pretty much heavy hauling. So that's just straight science since grade five. Mm -hmm. So I basically got involved with what you would call here in Canada enrichment programs from an early age. I don't know what you call it down in South. Maybe it's gifted or special (laughs) access. Yeah, like honors. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like I, I was very clear about trying to find answers and um, very uh, much into digging into libraries and finding how to put things together. So it really started in grade five and I did a complete presentation on how the evolution occurs from a single-celled organism up to modern man. Now, and that's towing all the accepted criteria lines. Um, And I continued to do so well into my physics faculty program that I started in uh, 99, 2000. Now, I've had several other sort of caveats of secondary education, including advertising arts, digital design, um, engineering program. Um, And so I've come back to physics and math. Mm -hmm. And I guess what started to emerge was an understanding that things were not as they would seem. And the questions I was asking in the halls of academia were not being answered to my satisfaction. Let's just say that. And I started to make note of a certain, let's call it a a, a consciousness or presence within academia. It partly appreciated it, but partly I felt it was holding me back. And there was too many answers in too many wide varying fields that I couldn't sort of wrestle with in one faculty alone because as we will unfold this whole project that I now call the Mayan Rosetta Stone it's quite interdisciplinary is what they would call it this is spanning all faculties Mm -hmm. so basically without sort of launching into everything um, I'm at a point where I've gone into a sabbatical mode um, leaving the Department of Physics and Mathematics still very dear to my heart, but it's something that I discovered during my undergraduate studies. So I decided to depart and... uh, So you mean the lack of research that you're seeing is in regards to the sun specifically? It wasn't so much as the lack of research. It was the overall type of... I I said sort of a general comment, like consciousness, and you're kind of going like, well, what does this guy mean? There was certain things that I observed, and I feel very fortunate to having those insights to the sort of inner politics of the faculty of physics and certain things that were, you know, the freedom to, let's say, explore any area was not an open door. 
and there were certain things that I wanted to push and proceed into that, let's just say, somebody going into a PhD program, which was the inevitable outcome of what I was doing, um, I had already felt out what the the aspects of what my possibilities would be. And it seemed very close-minded. And I was interested in probing in areas in ways that would probably seem too liberal for that mindset at that time, at that place. So, now, at, that, so at that point, you disconnected from academia and kind of moved into your own way of researching and studying. Can you give us your, can you go into your personal story about how you got into this research? Well, it uh, s certainly started within the halls of academia. And it's not that I left and didn't go back. I actually took s time, uh, several years, to sort of process what it was that I was starting to sort of see or access. And it was kind of a funny thing that was happening. And I noticed this with wherever I went, that I was continuing to ask questions. And other students would say to me, Clark, why do you keep asking, like, why? It's as if you're doubting the founding fathers of, of science and physics. And I, would, and I would restate this every time. It's not that I'm doubting them. It's just that in order for me to understand fully, I have to ask these questions. They qualify the arguments. I don't just lap it up. I have to ask and analyze, even though they're so-called accepted truths. You see what I mean? Yeah. So for me, I'm just doing what I would think is good homework. I'm trying to get down to the philosophical underpinnings of these modern accepted uh, theorems. Okay. So, so let's let's get into the actual Mayan Rosetta Stone and and the and your sure. journey because your story your your story is pretty interesting. Uh, let's let's get into that, please. Uh, what what? How did you? How did you start uncovering what's happening with the sun, why the sun is important, et cetera? Well, yeah, it, well, it didn't actually occur to me, and I could make the long story short by saying I, it would appear as though the, the sun directly interfaces at the, with the biology, and there's a particular type of case um, that's been somewhat uh, studied by the neuroscience people as of today, and these are what we call cerebral sensitive people. These are people that are sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies. Now, at the time, I didn't know that. I didn't even know these terms. And in fact, I didn't start getting into sort of the neurophysiology of it all until years later. That'd be the mid 2000s. And at the time, I just found myself engrossed into trying to understand the body, how it interacts with our environment. And it would take me years to figure out all of the space weather correlations. At the time, I was just fascinated by trying to figure out the role of food, the role of sustenance, you know, the simple stuff in metaphysics and martial arts that is like square one. But as I proceeded into 2003, it was at that point that we were at the peak of solar cycle 23. Um, it technically, it was the second peak because as anyone will tell you, and clearly you'll see on the graphical data, every solar cycle has two peaks. It's kind of like looking at one of your molars uh, from a side view. So it's got the first peak and the second peak. It was at that second peak that I got kind of struck and down with something that I couldn't put my finger on. It seemed to be something that was just chewing me and thinning me away. I became allergic to everything under the sun. So you know, basically it was forcing me into a sort of cleanse, fast, vision quest scenario that was pretty much foisted on me. And right. this was several months. And when I kind of came out of it, it was literally like my consciousness had been shifted. Colors didn't look the same anymore. It was in fact a, a sort of a, a morphogenetic uh, shift of what I was from what I became. Some people like to use the whole uh, gestation of the uh, caterpillar into the butterfly, and that would probably seem to fit. But it would take me years after this whole circumstance to figure out the what we would call today the chronobiology, chronos or chrono being time, or the heliobiology. It took me years to sort this all out, and there's exquisite treasure trove of data between all these different fields that interconnect. And I'd say by far the most fascinating, because you can get stuck in climate and the studies with how sun and the climate are affected, but I, to me, the most fascinating stuff is how this energy is actually 
interacting with our biology, interacting with our endocrine system, and interacting with our consciousness and creating, in some cases, subtle shifts and in some cases, very potent concoctions of neurohormones. So, so I know that we have lunar cycles and yes. we're aware of that. And, you know, we, we talk about the 28 day sort of moon and, and, and the, how that affects, you know, the tidal waves. And so there's in your work, there seems to be a link between what the sun is doing, how the sun is affecting the moon and thereby affecting the earth. Am I getting that right? How does that, how does that work? Okay. The, the lunar phase is 29.53 days. Okay. Um, now, to, to kind of launch into this, uh, it was it was really Michael Persinger, uh, Dr. Persinger, from the head of the neuroscience uh, division at the University of Laurentian up here in Sudbury, where the big neutrino detector is. He was the one who kind of um, took a lot of my kind of crazy high-flying ideas. I just come back from Mexico, and I had gone through some interesting circumstances at the pyramids and ceremonies, which we can maybe get into later. But he took all these high-flying ideas and these visions and my interest in physics, and he kind of gelled it out by explaining to me how the moon basically acts as a very basic fundamental oscillation of the geomagnetic field and the Schumann resonance and how our consciousness is intimately tied into this. Now, he, he's at the head of that sort of gestalt, gestalt of research that's looking at how these uh, frequencies interact with consciousness. And he's basically trying to see how they can take those magnetic frequencies and apply them to the brain through what he calls transcranial stimulation and produce things like the God experience. Basically trying to systematically go through ways and frequencies uh, that are all within this small, small scale nanoteslas really of magnetic stimulus onto the brain which show very distinct uh, circumstances arising. So Clearly, the moon plays a very fundamental role because it's constantly uh, going in and out of the geomagnetic tail, and it's acting somewhat like a, a, a satellite dish, uh, perturbing the conductive layers of the ionosphere. Hmm. And hmm. as soon as you alter conductive layers of the ionosphere, you might as well say you're changing the overall intensity and the overall – the frequencies uh, will change as well. And – so if you consider uh, like how the brain functions within this, the brain turns out to be a very interesting sort of tuned resonant circuit, almost like, well, anything in our modern society uses this sort of antenna principle uh, or tuning fork principle. Mm -hmm. And basically the brain is uh, nothing short of a Schumann resonant designed or evolved within uh circumstance that is the brain clearly had to evolve within the schumann field for millions of years okay so let's it, let's 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 back up just a little bit let's rewind sure. and let's go back to okay when when we hear about solar flares and we we notice yes. there's a cme how does that affect the human body what occurs <laughs> well that's <laughs> that's a really big question man so you want to say body and you want to uh, perhaps simplify this as how I simplify this. And I, I believe this ties into sort of one of the contemporary leading experts on the body, which is by my account, Bruce Lipton. And Bruce Lipton is teaching us about the biology of perception. And that's a super key role. Now, I'm sort of piggybacking on a lot of giants' shoulders, and I, I, I make no mistake about that. There's several researchers I, I'm standing on the shoulders of. Bruce Lipton happens to be one of them. Okay. Now, he discusses how stress, uh, the fight or flight response occurs, and our, it's up to our perception to basically tackle or decide on how to react to a circumstance. What I'm saying is a little bit a step uh, behind that or above that, if you're using top-down method methodologies, and is to say that, well, there's a whole host of literature in the uh, chronobiology field, which is a really exquisite area of medical um, experts from around the world who are looking at circadian rhythms and how they're tying into such things as solar wind, for example. There's a really good study by a doctor who... Uh, basically, um, 
had a continuous setup where he's measuring his own uh, blood pressure, so his diastole and his systole, over the course of – it was a, a multi-year study. And what they found is that the, the correlation between his blood pressure and the solar wind were like a, a high correlative coefficient. Okay. So – we should so, stop there and kind of go. So I find it personally when yeah. when I notice that, and I do observe what's happening with the sun quite a lot. I do check it every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I do. I find that when there's a solar storm, I personally get really sensitive. Like I yes. am, my emotions are very sensitive, and like I, I mean, I don't know. It, it approaching clairvoyance i mean like psychic phenomena like all these all these really interesting things yeah. sort of happen to me when the sun is flaring out so how do you explain this so <clears throat> this uh there's 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 several um theories that attempt to tackle this uh for example just to somewhat make a, a closed loop here with uh, Bruce Lipton is he, he talks about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is basically a core functional sensor system of the body. Um, and that's one really good way of looking at how this energy is interacting with the, with the body. Now, how exactly does, say, the Schumann resonance? So we have to kind of pick one topic in, and deal with that because there's obviously several layers of the electromagnetic spectrum that we uh, live within that is directly modulated by Earth, Moon, Sun, and planets. So if we were just to focus on a, a small discourse on the Schumann resonance, well, um, this is uh, another lead that Persinger gave me, which is another neuroscientist by the name of Nunes. Now, Nunes publishes in uh, neuroscience textbooks, and he's got his own um, books on the electric fields of the brain. And basically what he's shown is that the cranial structure of the skull, so human skull, cranial uh, resonance cavity structure, if you will, of the brain can be uh, mathematically modeled with the same kind of equations that uh, Otto Schumann uh, modeled theoretically of the ionosphere in 1952. Okay. So what we're saying here is that if the action potential of synaptic firing in the brain is in resonance with the uh, frequency of the electrons in this ionosphere, what we're saying is that the standing waves between the two are tuned together. So even in English, is, man, let's like let's simplify this down just because okay, I, don't, so your I brain, have no idea what you're talking about. Your brain is a small <laughs> is a small say tuning fork. Right. Okay. And of course, I'm trying to give you some details technically that this has to do with the resonance of the actual geometric structure of the brain. Okay. And you have electrons firing in your brain, and those create what we would call EEG spectrum, which is your alpha, your beta, you know, and it basically ranges from zero hertz up to 30 odd hertz. Okay. Now, is it not coincidental that the Schumann resonance? is basically overlapping that exact same frequency. Mm, that's very interesting. In engineering, yeah. we refer to the spectrum as ELF. That's basically 0 to 30 hertz. So now, all the, the Schumann, activity, Schumann resonance is the very, the the vibration or the, the frequency at which the magnetic field around the Earth is vibrating at. Is that right? It's the particular area between um, the ionosphere and the ground. Okay. And it's because that that area of the uh, atmosphere is conductive. Now there's other areas around that called the geomagnetic field. Um, but that's not a frequency uh, of the same sort that we're talking about. Just to kind of separate, there is these two different areas of okay. geomagnetic field. So, so there is, there is a link between the human resonance, the human brain and I, I really want to know how the sun starts to affect the brain, like neurochemically, neurologically, right. the yep. neuroplasticity of this. And gotcha. Well, that's actually um, we're we're in the midst of creating several info posters that will um, absolutely help people see this because there is a lot of technical literature and vernacular behind all this. Um, so the visuals are quite helpful, and we will have those up on the website. 
soon enough to help with this discourse. But to, to sort of pin down the, uh, the neuroplasticity, which is really new topics. I mean, when you consider that 10, 15 years ago to say that your, your brain could just uh, regrow new stem cells in, in vitro is just absolutely would have been, you've been laughed at. And now we, it's just, we take it as point of fact. But now we're getting down to the nitty gritty, which is, um, is it just happening on Fridays because you're all excited? Like what, what's the method to the madness is basically what you're asking me, right? Right. And you're already taking the supposition or hypothesis that the sun is playing um, an active role in this, right? And basically what we need to hash out is the, the details, right? So we, we've gotten to a point of understanding that the sun is intimately connected with the earth and that the energetic fields from the sun reach out and connect with this geomagnetic field. And it's from that point that a whole range of things happen and the, shall we say, the collateral action, because I don't want to call it damage, um, occurs as it filters through the atmosphere and eventually filtering on to us. Now, to truly understand this, one might want to understand that um, magnetic fields do play a very intrinsic role on how consciousness can be, occur or can be altered to occur artificially. So when you kind of look at a lot of the Persinger literature that he's published over the last 40 years, you, <clears throat> you really start to see that um, there's a way to stimulate this neurogenesis, which is a, a, a neural hormone production. And those in turn create neurotransmitters. And so those uh, neurotransmitters are, are what we then get into the sort of fight or flight response. Are you, for example, there's, there's people that will become sensitive, yes, but the direction that you go when you receive this energy is still up to the user. It's, it's your own brain, man. So it's you, you, the user interface is often what is attributed to such things as the pyramid. The pyramid effect, as many uh, have detailed, is, is somewhat um, like a vortex. It's what you take into it. It amplifies it. So it amplifies what you're already working with. But there are definitely very specific exercises that we see in the Mayan lore that effectively deal with how to live within a very active period of the sun. And in fact, it, this is a supposition that I've had to come to, uh, is that the, the, the Mayans had a very detailed calendar of how this electromagnetic activity that we live within, the field, the matrix, if you will, how it was modulated over a period of time. And in fact, it's what we found to be the long count calendar. Now, their whole life and social structure is absolutely different than ours. They lived in a way that honored what was happening on the sun so that when the sun is acting very violent, they had dates to basically, from my point of view, that would predict that so that they could go into vision quests and ceremonies and, say, not be driving on the highway. Wow. Or, you know. Wow. So it's like we're talking about... You know, and this might be jumping to the absolute uh, conclusion of all this research I've been doing, but looking at the way the Mayans actually handled this type of insight is, to me, looking at a type 2 or type 3 civilization. Somebody who works with this solar energy is on a whole different level. Let me, let me stop you right there. So, okay, so um, when you say type 2 civilization... Earth is classified right now as a type zero civilization? That's according to the physicist <laughs> Michio Kaku. So, okay, who's, so... Who's so also type... supposing we would get into 20... Uh, about 2040, he supposes, will be a type one civilization. That's according to the Kardashev scale, which is denoted by the type of energy systems that we use. Okay, okay. So a type two civilization would be classified as... Uh, a civilization that was traveling through sp space and had had free energy, is that basically? Um, well, you might say that, but it's um, 
Well, how would how would a, a type two civilization be classified? It's a better question. Uh, well, certainly anyone can look up the Kardashev scale, um, but say, say type one technology has to do with basically fairly similar to what is being obtained on Earth. It's it's a, typically denoted in the amount of watts that we're able to utilize. So we can pretty much effectively use the type of technology we are today and obtain type one. Okay. It's when we get to type two that we really have to be harnessing energy uh, basically from a different type of vantage point. Perhaps different physics is involved. Uh, I would suspect that would be so. That our physics will have to allow certain things to happen. Um, for example, wormholes. Today, physics will tell us wormholes could not be sustained or open for any kind of use because the amount of energy that's necessary absolutely astronomical. But from another physics vantage point that perhaps understands wormholes a whole lot better, you might see that they're, well, they manifest quite spontaneously. And if you could predict when and where they happen, then you might not need the energy to sustain the wormhole because it happens quite naturally. Now, I'm actually leading into something quite a bit bigger when I say this, so I'm not just using this as an analogy. Okay. But I'd, indeed, when you're talking about type 2 or type 3 civilization, this is another sort of level to which we would have to understand. Okay. What, why Mayan Rosetta Stone? I mean, why, why is that the title of your work? Okay. Well, the Rosetta Stone, for those that don't know, just, just the Rosetta Stone part of it is having to do with the, the lexicon that actually enabled us to translate Egyptian from, from Greek. And that was uh, located uh, uh, between the front paws of the Sphinx. That became sort of um, an idea for, for me that was not just a metaphor for something that could help us see into the past and obviously translate Egyptian hieroglyphics was a huge step for us. What I'm seeing from the Aztec Sunstone is a computational algorithm that allows us to see the science and therefore the physics, therefore the technology, and therefore the civilization social structure of the past. And so by taking the Sunstone and deciphering the cycles that I have, I'm seeing evidence of science that is more advanced than ours today. And I'm translating it into modern science using the, the best that our space physics uh, can provide. So modern satellite data, modern algorithms, modern you know computer finesse statistics, and uh, all the best mathematics that our genius scholars have provided including all the way back to Newton himself. So I'm standing on all of this technology, all the satellite data, and uh, the very best that mathematics can offer, and we're just starting to peel back the skin of this proto-civilization that I would call Mayan, but I would suspect predates everything that we know has occurred in Mesoamerica. That's modern accepted uh, knowing. So we're looking at something that is clearly what they call antediluvian, perhaps previous to the Ice Age, something that has been washed out and somewhat forgotten about and has been used sort of, let's say, half mixed into the, the, what we would call the Aztec uh, philosophies today. Okay. Okay. So I'm starting to get a little bit of a picture here. Let's let's make it a little bit more clear. Sure. Um, now there there was a sort of Mayan thing happening in 2012 where right. it looked like there was an, a misinterpretation of the long count versus <laughs> and it seems like there's a there's a whole uh, idea or or something that people are not understanding there. Can you just clarify that for us? What is what is the actual meaning of a long count? What's why didn't yes. the world end in two thousand twelve? Oh, bueno. Well, um, basically, I mean, let, let's let's take a look at the 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 start date, the end date. Um, I, I would think that the end date put forward at, at December twenty first was um, another one of these events that I I'm not sure if it's completely concocted by media. 
I suspect that com when we compare it to the start date of the Mayan calendar or the the long count calendar, um, which had, I mean, 18 researchers spent a good chunk of their life to produce that date of 3114, August 13th, BC, and that is now called today the Goodman Martinez Thompson correlation. That has had exquisite amount of detailing and finessing and like. I mean, you can read up on it on, on the internet. It, it had a lot of background. Now, December 21st, 2012 came about, and I found, personally, the amount of evidence to pin that date out was not very well hashed out in, in any sense of the matter, um, let alone the, the data supporting where exactly, archaeologically, in the Mayanology that was found, um, was fairly hodgepodge. And so, first of all, I'd like to say that that is a speculative end date. There's nothing wrong with trying to pin it on a solstice or an equinox because a lot of these calendars are very much so hinged on the, the eight, say, cardinal points of the year, the, the, two, the two equinoxes, the two solstices, and the two uh, zeniths and the two nadirs. Mm -hmm. So, and that's partly why the calendar sunstone is uh, vivisected in, in, in portions of eight. Um, but to put a whole whack load of uh, intrepidation and uh, focus on one date and something happening on that one date um, is not exactly how I've come to understand the calendar works. See, there's many cycles within the calendar, and to think that you would only focus on the end date, you're, you're you know, looking, you're overlooking the whole intrinsic detailing that the calendar does. Like the first day value is one day, which is a kin, and if you take twenty days, you get to a win out. So, and then it continues to go up from there, generally in a vigesimal or 20 base count. But so what is it that they were trying to do? Most of what the long count represents to have it focused on one day and then have that day fail, I mean, clearly it's being, uh, I would say, artificially inflated to be put up on a, on, on a scale that when it failed, it would mean that people would just forget about it. And so for me, I'm trying to dig out what this was actually doing. So the question is, if it's not about an end date, what is it about? A start date. Well, you need the start date, <laughs> for sure. Okay. But if it's an... if And so there's interviews with the, some of the elders, and I've spent time with them. The There's various elders in the Nahuatl that would look at the Aztec Sunstone and say, this is a mathematical concept. And I'm just adding to that and saying it's actually an algorithm, which means it's, it's about chomping out smaller day value cycles. And now, <coughs> excuse me, um, we're starting to see that in our space uh, satellite data. We're starting to see magnetic complexities occurring over smaller than 11-year sunspot cycles. That means... We don't just need to look forward to when the peak, the next peak is. There's actually these small, um, what they call multi-cycles, which occur in the data. And that it turns out that there's an embryonic cycle to the sunspot's magnetic complexity. And that seems to be a function of what they call in the solar system planetary beats. And a beat, other than beep, beep, beep beat like a drum beat is actually the beat of a frequency or orbital period if you will wow. they refer to these they refer to these as gravitational frequencies which is another term in the vernacular for planetary periods of orbit and they play a role somewhat again like music and these theories go all the way back to Kepler who tried to sustain this all with musical octaves and basically trying to figure out how the sun works. And in a sense, when you look at the long count calendar, it is nothing short of a harmonic set of numbers that are exquisitely valuable. And at the end of all this, you realize, and my supposition going into it was that I wonder if this is more than just a sun calendar, meaning 
if I want to prove that there's actually solar physics in this sun calendar, what do I need to do? How do I need to prove that? And so if the first thing I did is I pulled apart the, the sunstone itself because I realized there was clearly, this was a, like a multi-layered Photoshop job here I had to do. <laughs> yeah. And whoever created this, which we, by the way, we have no known author of the Aztec sunstone. It is there. It was found buried in Mexico City, but we really don't know who created it. I can tell you this much, whoever did that is a flippin' genius. Because what is encrusted into that rock was clearly an effort to preserve... So what, is, what does all of this information mean? Okay, so, yeah, the sun affects the earth, the Mayans had some awareness of what was happening here. It's what all is, about what energy is this, cycles. What does this mean for us now, today? What can we learn from this, you know, through this conversation? What can can people really understand through what we're discussing here? <laughs> well, I mean, you talk, you, in your work, you talk a little bit about the hero's journey. I, I'd like yes. to get into that a little bit. Ah, uh, yes. Well, isn't this interesting? I mean, there's many mythologies from every sector of the world. And clearly, Joseph Campbell, who was the sort of protege to George Lucas, and pretty much the, the way that Star Wars was laid out was on the, on, on the heels of... Uh, Heroes with a Thousand Masks and, and Joseph Campbell's work was basically looking at all the mythologies around the world. And it was in Campbell's last book that he started to look at numbers and how numbers kept reoccurring in all these global mythologies. I mean, mythologies from totally different sectors of the world were using the same number which was coming up again and again, which is the 432 number. So he was making note of this in, the, in his book. Uh, this is the last book he published before he, he passed on, which is Inner Reaches of Outer Space. And um, he made note of this. And he was trying to kind of wonder, like, what is the significance of this in terms of the hero's journey? Why would they figure it necessary to continually use numbers in the mythological story? And so it's from that point that I want to pull people's attention to what is m kind of concurrent with our, our society. Because if I start talking about the Riggs Thula and, you know, Icelandic lore, people are going to kind of go, well, I really don't understand any of that. <laughs> but what people do understand is the genius of Tolkien. J.R.L. Tolkien has produced probably the best mythology that modern man has been... Talking about Lord of the Rings here? Talking Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. What okay. was unique... I'm going to ask you a question now. Let's see if you were paying attention when you watched this. What was you, unique about those two trilogies that were the same? Oh, Clark, you're going to well, hate me, dude. I, <laughs> yeah. I actually fell asleep. Right. I fell asleep. That's the only movie that I've ever fell asleep in, and I, and I fell asleep okay. in that movie. I'm so sorry, man. I just... So I don't understand that reference. Why okay, don't you just yeah, tell okay, us? Okay. So... What caught my attention, because I'm no Tolkien connoisseur, I'll admit that right up front. I haven't read the books, so when I watch the movies, what really caught my attention, because here I am totally engrossed in the cycle research, is that to the day that Frodo left the Shire, to the day he was back in 13 months. And I kind of went, that's very interesting. Why would they do that? Okay, so for the listener that's listening to this, and he's going, okay, 13 months, what's so significant about that? 13 months, there's two significant things about 13 months. First of all, the lunar synodic period is 13 months. Second of all, and I think almost on a hierarchical basis, Jupiter, okay, Jupiter synodic period is 399 days, which is essentially 13 months. It, it, it does variate, but... Essentially, why do we even care about Jupiter is what we're finding out with all the latest data pooling in is that Jupiter's got a mammoth electromagnetic field, one so large, in fact, that it can dwarf uh, the size of the coronasphere of the sun. So it's hmm. over 250,000 kilometers across. Hmm. And data suggests, now really good data, from the Russian uh, Academy of Science shows that whenever we pass in front of Jupiter, meaning we're, we're lapping, we're about to lap Jupiter in, in orbit and we're about to pass it. Well, for us to go back to the same point we were at, it takes us a year, 365 days. But to catch up to Jupiter from where we last saw him and passing him in orbit takes us that extra... 13, you know, uh, 13 months. Or, sorry. Well, it takes us yeah. the extra 34, yeah. 35 days. Wow. And 
that function now we know for certain from what the Russians have done, Skriabin being one of the, the leaders in this field, shows us that whenever we pass in front of Jupiter, definite changes in solar wind are occurring. We know this because we can take ground-based measurements of isotopes. Those isotopes give us clear, distinct signals of whenever the sun is being modulated or whenever the cosmic radiation that comes from background space is being modulated. So every 400 days when we get in front of Jupiter, we experience a phenomena of electromagnetic oscillation. Now, seeing how we've just covered how this human resonance is such a, a prime uh, driver to consciousness, isn't it interesting that Tolkien decided to ascribe the whole journey of not just Frodo, but Bilbo, over a 13-month journey. Hmm. Now, and it's called Lord of the Rings, and doesn't Jupiter have a large ring around the center of it, I think? It does have a ring, but not, not quite as distinct as uh, it. Well, its ring, just for the, for the record, is an invisible ring of electromagnetism, with the, namely the moon Isle which is a huge plasma ring, often seen, you know, we see electrical um, conductivity occurring between that moon and, and, the, and, and Jupiter itself. And in fact, it creates a whole radio frequency spectrum unique to that orbit. So it, it is constantly bombarding us with radio frequencies as well. You might say Jupiter is in a place of pure potential. It okay. creates, uh, in a sense, more energy than it's receiving from the sun. Okay. 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 Which so, so, so we've covered a lot of information. It's like ripping through this this data. There's there's a part of your work that goes into some tools that you offer to help people. Is that is that what you call them? What well, what are those? What are some of those? Yeah. Things? At the end of the day, I mean, data, knowledge, I mean, sure, people will, if, you know, if they went through, I don't know, 10 hours of, of this material and they could sit through a 10-hour lecture and get, get everything about all the science, at the end of the day, they say, okay, I am living on a planet that's bombarded by electromagnetic frequencies. Those frequencies are constantly in, in a cyclical behavior. They're constantly bringing me up and bringing me down, so I experience the highs and lows of life. What does it mean? Okay, this would be the first time in our known history that we'd have the ability to predict when an event would happen. What would that mean, Xavier, if I told you on such and such day that, well, let's look at the day that just passed because, I mean, really, that was one of the dates that I had calculated. And so I don't know at, at times what's going to happen. It's, it's an, an electromagnetic point in the algorithm. And so I found it interesting that we just got hit by a nice uh, solar wind that sort of comes through the system and basically dentiates us with high energy from the sun. So what, what would it mean if you know you're being affected by this, but I can now give you lead time and say – how, how would you want to prepare? Now, I could give you tools to prepare that are in part based upon metaphysical techniques, uh, but they're pretty ubiquitous throughout martial arts, throughout yoga, and throughout meditational practices. There are certain visualization exercises that uh, certainly allow you to uh, feel more grounded and more connected because it's at these times when there's a high amount of energy coursing through your body that if you don't have techniques – it's at that point that, you know, we can steer people into what happens when you don't have techniques and say you have propensities for the more dramatic flair or the more psychological imbalances. Right. Well, we do know that when this energy is fluctuating, uh, myocardial heart infarctions or heart attacks are much higher when the geomagnetic storms are occurring. So obviously learning how to breathe using some of the tools that are already available in the Global Coherence Initiative website, which deals with you know monitoring the heart and trying to meditate and breathe through these times because these are awful, like these are supercharged periods of time. And to be kind of sideswiped by them and not know that they're occurring is, a, is a, a, somewhat of a, a young species that we are. 
And even though we have lots of tools and toys and technology, we, we still don't understand how our environment is affecting us and how by doing these certain techniques, um, simple t techniques really that anyone could learn in a yoga class, um, how they could be applied at very specific times. You actually really need these tools at very specific times because they can help balance you out and furthermore help to supercharge your meditation to take you, uh, uh, as if I were to quote from the, the scripts of, of the Mayan uh, Palenque uh, hieroglyphs that they open portholes. Mm -hmm. This is the act that the Mayan kings, the divine kings, would take upon themselves. They would enact these ceremonies, often using bloodletting, but in some cases not, and they would take the journey upon themselves to open a portal. These are direct uh, transcriptions of the Mayanologists. But they failed. For what reason? Why would they open portals? Well, let's look at portals as a function of the mind. To me, there is no better particle accelerator than that which you have upstairs in your head. Right. You, you can't buy anything better than what the brain is. The brain is an exquisite, amazing design that interacts with this high energy from the sun, from the planet. It's partly why these pyramids were placed in the positions that they were. And I'll tell you, if anyone hasn't figured out, the, the research of Burke in the book Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty is exquisite. It shows how the magnetic fields and the electric potential oscillates with these seasonal uh, values, with the diurnal circadian rhythms. So we know that it affects seeds. It We know that it improves agricultural uh, growth potential. We know that it affects consciousness because the Persinger's worked. So the, the 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 pyramid is really the ultimate understanding of a tool that helps mitigate the energy from up there in the atmosphere, the sun, down here to the earth, and where we are with our brains and our psychotronic activity. So is it is it possible that the sun is working in a way that could perhaps charge the pineal gland and induce these sort of almost psychedelic experiences in the brain? I mean, wasn't, wasn't McKenna working, Terrence yeah. McKenna working on a time wave zero aspect of, of things as well? Novelty theory. Can yes. you connect, can you connect that together for us? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I'm a big fan of McKenna's work. I personally attempted for the, the better part of a few years to get my head wrapped around time wave zero. And I just didn't think that, it was quite as clear as what I was looking for. And so what I produced was I, and I'm saying this humbly because I have a lot of respect for, for what McKenna did, but I was looking for something a little more integral, something that I could actually pin down to specific cycles. So the work that I've really tried to show people is what's happened specifically in these interesting little seven-year periods. Um, this was also uh, taken note by the great work of... Um, Alexander Chijewski, who got into a lot of trouble for publishing the Mass Human Index, which shows the correlation between sunspot activity and the human excitability phenomena. Now, what am I saying and how does that relate to novelty? Let's tie this all in. Um, well, novelty is another way of I mean, these are all just different terms. So human index, human excitability, novelty, they're all tied together because it's us expressing the energy. But it's very clear that the different energy produces within us a different type of, let's call it homeostasis, but clearly what, what would you call the Occupy movement other than a direct implication of another type of energy coming into the human brain, to the human physiological complex. And Chajewski made note of this. He said we, the sign of this three-year period was that we would get up in arms. We would be unhappy with the status quo. We would challenge mainstream ideology. So I tie this into uh, three things for these seven-year periods. I tie it into a what's called a geohelio coupling, which is like literally like the Carrington event or the Quebec blackout. Mm -hmm. These are geomagnetic storms that affect the power grid and they're very well documented. And so at the time, say in 1989, what else was happening in 1989? 
come on, people, lots of stuff was happening in 1989. There wasn't just geo, like historical geomagnetic blackouts. There was the 888 uprising in Burma, the fall of the Berlin Wall. There was 100,000, there was 100,000 Chinese protesting in the TME Square. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we have three different categories. We've got the geomagnetic storm, which is more of the technical space weather phenomena. Then we have the protests and reformation. And then we have the third area, which is more of the uplifting aspect to it all, which is the human novelty. And so what was happening in 1989? We're just going to stick with this for this example. In 1989, we had probably one of the most, um, you know, crazy science stories of the millennia, which is this idea about cold fusion, meaning this is something that could have changed the history books, the science books, and it got quickly squashed. This all occurred in a very short year of 1989. All these things trying to change the way that the human course, the human vector was, was operating at. So I found a fundamental frequency that is a seven-year period, not too dissimilar than what the Kabbalistic, uh, Kabbalistic tradition refers to as the Jubilee cycle. So going seven years from 1989, you can find that the protest slash blackouts slash uh, quarter million ducks dying slash novelty of, well, what happened in uh, 1996? We had the first real sign of artificial intelligence, which was the fact that uh, Deep Blue beat uh, chess champ uh, Kasparov. Mm, right, right. Pretty big, pretty big uh, innovation, I would say, in that year. What and, else happened? I mean, even recently, there was uh, the Arab Spring, and then... Yeah, yeah, we're, then, we're yeah. getting to that. That's part of the seven-year, that's part of the seven-year functionality of the electromagnetic cycle that has been denoted as the Jubilee cycle. And so, seven years from 96... Almost to the day, there was an article actually in the uh, Los Angeles Times that said it was very eerie that somehow, almost to the day, seven-year period, there was another blackout. It affected 55 million people between London, Sweden, Sweden, Italy. There was numerous blackouts, and we had the top CME, or coronal mass ejection, ever recorded in 2003. Now, keeping in mind, that was the year that I got sick and struck and down with some immune-comprising thing. And what else happened uh, in, 19, in 2003? We had the Guinness Book record for the largest anti-war rally, 36 million people. What else happened for novelty in 2003? So we're jumping in seven years, right? So 2003, we had the Human Genome Project was completed. Jumping seven years from there, we get to 2010. Well, we had massive blackouts in 2010, rare multi-species die-offs. We had the Arab Springs spawning a global Occupy movement. And now we get to the final category of human novelty. Again, we find amazing breakthroughs. And I would say on the top of the list, which there were several things, graphene is a Nobel Prize. The first stable supercapacitor was developed and still being developed to this day, which, of course, would take over all of our known battery and charge holding capabilities and revolutionize that whole, that whole industry. Very so, interesting. These are things that happen in seven-year periods. It's an expression of our... We, we, we know about the, these things. They've been tried to be dismissed as the seven-year itch is nothing. It's just some lore. You know, we dismiss a lot to lore and supernatural mythologies. What I'm saying is I used to be skeptical too, but I actually looked into things and I looked into them deeply and started seeing that there are clear connections between what's happening with this energy from the sun and this I clearly would vector in on Chajewski. He started the, uh, the avalanche in this research and to, to today, Chajewski's work is still being hashed and developed out by medical experts around the world in the area of coronal biology, which is time specific biology. So tumor temperatures, for example, correlate with cycles. And if you effectively treat tumors when they're at their hottest temperature, you have a much higher success rate at dealing with them. It's things you, like that. Have you noticed uh, between the sort of micro macrocosm that we've established that, but with our sun, the, the solar system, it, is, there, is there something similar happening with other suns and other solar systems? Very good, very good. Uh, yes, and in fact, um, 
it is the supposition of the Mayan Rosetta Stone project that other than the fact that we are distant stars and that our measuring of them is actually going to be based upon the time it takes for us to witness, it would seem that uh, on a non-local level that all the stars are connected at their centers in between or interstitially through space-time. So that this is part of a grand cosmic clock, which for those who are familiar with the holographic theory, um, they would take note of this area of what, what is called entrainment. And so, simple aspects of entrainment are like the, the grandfather clocks in a room will all start to synchronize over a period of time or... Um, uh, studies that have been done on uh, women who are um, collectively uh, in in cohabitation start uh, uh, synchronizing their menstrual periods. So th this functionality of resonance of entrainment, uh, we believe, is starting at the sort of protostellar level. That is, that the functionality of these harmonics is one that comes from the inside out. It's part of a geometric manifold that is facilitating the energy manufacturing in the, the sun and the planets. Therefore, it is, in fact, synchronized from the inside out. So, indeed, we will be able to support this theory in, in due time. But one of the things I'd like to point out that is often overlooked and or, or it has become the focus of this sort of um, 2012 debate um, for, for many years now has been the focus on looking at the source of this as, as the galactic center. And albeit there is a most definite source of energy from the galactic center, um, so far as I've been able to see, there is no readily available data to support um, frequencies, cycles um, of that sort that come from, you know, vectors that would originate from the galactic source. In terms of the, uh, John Major Jenkins even said himself in, in his book, My Cosmogenesis, that because the galactic center is so large, we in fact end up eclipsing it for 300 years. So we really don't know where the center is. To say that somehow our eclipse, December 21st, is of some significance is a rather specious argument because we have no vectors, we have no specificity, and that takes away from that's, – that's almost like a, a misleading or disinformational argument to me because it takes away from the very readily available measurements we have on, say, Jupiter and Saturn. And so those are – so Clark, we've been important. we've been talking for about sixty minutes, and yep. which is about the attention span of your average listener. <laughs> and so I, I'd re I'd like to spend the next ten minutes or so just kind of putting all this together, like like let's let's connect this all in, and we can definitely do a round two of this. I, I really think that a lot of your research is is really really interesting, and I, I definitely want to come back to this, but. But as a sort of breakout, I know that this is kind of your first podcast. So, so how do you connect all this back together? What is your sort of message to the people who are listening to this type of stuff? Um, let's let's kind of let's bring it back in. Well, I I do enjoy the work of Bruce Lipton. I'd, I'd love to come back to him because he's making a very important point. We have a medical establishment that says if you have these genes you basically will suffer the consequences of your ancestral DNA that in fact you have no choice over it and I'm here to say that not only like Bruce Lipton is saying you not only have choice over it but your choice determines the outcome of how those genes express themselves that's meaning that you have the power to make the change now what I'm adding to this is by saying that what presents itself in the mind as fight or flight responses is where Bruce Lipton stopped. And this is where my whole game starts. Because what is creating, what is driving the sensation of the fight or flight response is in fact this background radiation that is almost entirely exclusively coming from the sun. And that that 
knowledge of knowing that this cyclical variation is quite natural. Uh, it has many intended qu consequences in a sense. I say intended, but in actuality, it affects the whole environment that is not only us, but what we live in. There are the components of looking at how we can interact more consciously with that which is occurring in a state of natural periodicity, natural cyclical activity. And we can learn to ride the waves. For example, if you're a cork on the ocean and you don't know there's a big wave coming in, there is no premeditation, there's no pre-pivoting, there's no preamble at all. There's just, the wave hits me. I'm here to say that, okay, you can take the choice, you can take the gene expression, but wouldn't it help a little bit if you knew that that wave was coming? Because right. you can get prepared. You don't have to maybe go into work that day. You can spend that time and make it your sacred space. So it's giving people a qualitative option to decide when to do the ceremony, when to do a vision quest. The natural points that have already basically presented themselves are the eight periods we spoke about in the calendar year. Now, there are some extra points to that, which directly have to do with the modulation of the magnetic field of the sun. And when you learn to live within that wave, you learn to ride the wave, you learn to surf the wave. But it, this is difficult because this is an invisible wave. And if you don't know that it's happening, you can often displace or misplace blame and create something out of this that would be on toward your own spiritual evolution. So us going forward in a type 2, type 3 civilization way, us behaving like more advanced species has to do with us acknowledging how to interact with what's already there. It's never going to go away. It's always going to be there and our body is always going to be interacting with it whether we like it or choose to not. So mm -hmm. our choice is simple that once we acknowledge that this natural oscillation is there and that it has potential to do things with us, for us, in a sense by activating the energy body, the HPA axis, the pineal gland, we don't then do it haphazardly. We do it with intention. And I cannot think of any better gift to give to humanity than the gift of intended intention to utilize this energy coming in as specific and thought out and meticulously well-planned or spontaneously as one might ever imagine. But to do it with the knowledge that there is an energy coming in, your body's naturally designed to utilize it, and here's the information. Do whatever you like to do. This isn't about being esoteric. If you're a mountain climber, well, there are natural points to which your body is peaking metabolically. So in the future, I suspect we will do what the minds did in the past. We will arrange, say, events around activities that the sun and the earth naturally cycle within. Very cool. Very, very cool. A lot of information in this episode, guys. I, wow. Uh, Clark, is there a website that people can get to uh, to contact you to get more information about this? Yeah, we're working on that. It's We've got a lot of information, a lot of info posters. I love teaching with graphics, and I've got a passion for graphics. And all of this is very technical. And when you're reading journals, you need the visuals. So I've worked the last 10 years on creating visuals for people. The MindRosettaStone.com will be launched wholeheartedly in like the next month. So please be patient. We've got academic papers. We've got info posters. We've got slideshows. We've got eBooks. It's all going to just gush through the gate at really once because that's how we're going to do it. And so, obviously there are some little things in here that are, shall we say, going to be eye openers for the technical community and people who are really looking for absolute vindication of this whole ancient astronaut theory. 
Well, let's just say I've got a couple nails for that coffin. <laughs> so say the website one more time, Mayan, the Mayan Rosetta Stone.com. Is that you it? You bet. You bet. You bet. All right, Clark. This was fascinating, man. We're definitely going to lock you in for a second round uh, in about six months or so. But uh, yeah, this is Xavier. You're listening to The Human Experience. This is such an intri- intriguing episode. Clark, Clark, thank you so much for your time, man. Um, Thanks for having me. We're going to get out of here, guys. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for listening.